Hey, good evening. Welcome to Firefighting Today, the weekly roundtable, where we meet every Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. We talk about all sorts of things fire service related. And tonight we're actually going to talk a little bit about hazardous materials, but uh, maybe from a from a different angle a little bit. Uh, we've, we've got some material to show for you. We are having trouble with our comment uh, tracker. But if you are watching us live on YouTube, uh, feel free to leave a comment. We will attempt to interact with you. But uh, if we don't, those comments remain up there and we're able to get back to you and, uh, and answer you a little bit later on. If you are on Twitter, if you happen to be live tweeting tonight, we do use the hashtag FFT, Firefighting Today, and we're calling this one Hazmat. So if you are with us and you'd like to... Uh, you'd like to do that, feel free to do that. So, my name is Peter Lamb. I'm the author of PeteLamb.com, and I'm the host of the Firefighter Training Podcast. We'll do a brief introduction of the panel, and uh, then we'll get started. Kevin, say hello. Hi, uh, Pete. Uh, Kevin Burns. I'm a deputy fire chief with the Framingham Fire Department up here in Massachusetts, just a little ways outside of Boston. Great. Thanks for being here, Kevin. I appreciate it. Greg is a new roundtabler tonight. Greg, say hello. Tell us uh, who you are and where you're from. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, Greg Howard. I'm the newly appointed Deputy Fire Chief. Uh, at my position is training and operations for uh, Little Two Hall Fire Department in mid-Vancouver Island called the Dashwood Volunteer Fire Department. Greg, it's a pleasure to have you here, and I know it's uh, you got to sneak off for supper, right? we got a three-hour time difference here, so uh, I appreciate you making the effort. Thanks. Ethan, say hello. Hey, Pete. Ethan Banza, Clarion, Ohio, student of the trade. Thank you, Ethan, and uh, also photo of the day on fire engineering, I might add. I always give the shameless plugs for Ethan when I can. Adam, say hello. Hey, guys. Uh, Adam, you know, I'm coming from Kellogg, Iowa, with a volunteer with the Kellogg Fire Department and also a captain. All right, great, great. So we're going to start a discussion on hazmat tonight, and I think the simplest thing to do is let's lay a quick foundation, if we can. And the foundation would be uh, Kevin and I really came from the same world, but I'll let Kevin explain it. So what happens if there is a hazmat in your department? Uh, now, what resources can you call in? Is there a statewide response, a county response, a regional response? Talk about what it is, and then we're going to back down from there, and we're going to talk about what capabilities an individual fire department might have in a hazmat situation. So, Kevin, do you feel comfortable just briefly describing what happens here in Massachusetts if there is a hazmat response? Sure, Pete. Um well, obviously, uh, you know, the local fire department would respond and make some sort of assessment as to uh, the need for additional uh, expertise, so to speak. And uh, we have uh, multiple hazmat districts within the state uh, with three levels of uh, service, uh, Tier 1, 2, and 3. And each one of that, uh, each one of those responses sort of ramps up uh, depending on uh, the size and scope of the incident, whether entry is going to be made, etc. Um, the Tier 1 response is um, uh, you get five or six techs with the, uh, the uh, technical operations man, uh, module uh, truck that essentially has uh, lots of equipment and uh, able to do sampling and so forth. Uh, and then basically the 2 and 3 responses, you just get additional uh, uh, hazmat technicians to um, affect entry and mitigate the uh, circumstance. All right, perfect. And we'll go back and we'll talk about your local department in a couple minutes. But uh, as Kevin said, we have about 250 or 300 members statewide across the Commonwealth. And, uh, you know, just for advice, you can call a Tier 1, which gets you the closest four or five members from you. Uh, and they, they, all members are members of fire departments, so it might be a mutual aid member. Each department puts up some members to make this regional team. Greg, very interested to know. So we're going to talk about your own department in a short bit, but what is your regional response? If you had a major hazmat situation, what can you, what can you call to bring to bear? 
I, I've got a really long wait for any serious hazmat response. Um, we used to have a railway that ran through the district. Uh, right now it's not in service. So most of our hazmat stuff would be rolling down the highway. So thankfully not the same scale we'd get uh, as with a railway incident. But um, we do everything through the PEP, which is a Provincial Emergency Preparedness. And they handle all our out of district rescue calls. And uh, I would have to wait for probably a hazmat team to come from Victoria, which is about a two hour code three run from here. And, so and, and the team has to get mobilized. So you may be well into the three hour range. Is that what yeah, I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I have nothing close. Uh, a lot of the mills, we don't have a mill in our area, but a lot of the pulp mills and things like that have their own uh, hazmat response units as part of the mill. Right. Uh, but that's not something that I have to deal with in, in my response area. Okay. All right. Fair enough. And we'll we'll talk about that. Ethan, do you know the status of uh, hazmat out in Ohio? What's uh, what's that like? Yeah, Pete, we're a little different here. We have uh, the state of Ohio is divided into nine regions, and we can get a state hazmat uh, team from uh, Columbus. Um, and here in my county, we have a county hazmat team, uh, which we have a large steel mill here, so we're running there uh, quite frequently. We're not too busy with hazmat, but uh, we do get our fair share. Uh, and we do have a county hazmat team that will respond up there, and also the mill does have a county team or a local team there, uh, and then uh, individual members will respond through a MABIS box too. Okay, perfect. And just uh, tell us what the acronym MABIS means. Uh, Mutual Aid Box Alarm System. Right, right, okay. And Adam, what goes on in your world uh, in terms of hazmat? How long would you wait to get a hazmat team? What kind of resources? Uh, our closest hazmat team is 8 Miles, which is our neighboring department. They're a full-time department. And uh, they're the hazmat team of our county. They've got a hazmat truck along with a hazmat trailer. Um, emergency management may even show up to a big hazmat situation. Okay. Okay, good. So th we, we know we have resources. And then I, I'd like to just run the panel once more before we start the, uh, the, the meat of the matter here. And that is, uh, what's your capability within your own department? Uh, we have some requirements that everyone has to be trained first responder operational level. Uh, but do you have any capabilities? Uh, Kevin, can your rescue company do anything uh, a little more than an engine company? Can you, have you got some department capabilities while you're waiting for a Tier 1 or Tier 2 response? Uh, Pete, probably the, uh, the biggest thing we have is a uh, mass econ that uh, we have that because of uh, having a hospital in our town, uh, the way the state runs has a hazmat, uh, has a hospital, has one of these mass decon units that will um, facilitate decontamination of a large number of, of victims. So we have that with the ability to set that up uh, within a relatively short period of time. Um, and we would have uh, actually right now only one hazmat tech uh, on our department that scaled down over the years, but uh, we would have that local expertise. Um, and just the general uh, hazmat training that we do, uh, uh, hopefully we're up to that operations level that you mentioned so we could, uh, um, you know, start uh, uh, doing those assessment techniques. Uh, we have an engine and an ambulance standing by for decon, and et cetera. Um, but that mass decon unit, that would be the sort of the plum, I guess. Sure, sure. And uh, just so everybody's aware, what they did in Massachusetts is every community with a hospital got this series of three tents. In fact, in the Northeast, those tents are heated, in fact, and they're able to, it's a, it's a portable car wash for people is really what it is. You put them in one end and they come out the other end, and, and basically that's what it is. Uh, you can see how technical this has met discussion is going to be when I'm talking about a cow wash for people, right? You can see where this is going. <laughs> but, uh, Greg, what capabilities do you have uh, within the two halls? If you got something you can be doing in the meantime, what's your, uh, what's your level or any equipment you might have? Yeah, we have some level two suits, but um, we train everybody to 10 and 1, uh, two operations. Um, but very seldom do we get any of that stuff out. Every once in a while we'll have uh, 
the police in with their clan lab team after a fire and, and we hose them off and give them a brush down. Right. And that's the extent of it. Right, right. Uh, Ethan, what's the local department capable of in terms of is there any special equipment, heavy rescue, or anything like that that would assist in a hazmat? Uh, I'm not too sure here, Pete. I know there is probably some very basic stuff on our tower truck. Uh, we don't have a rescue. It's combined with the tower. Uh, and then our county hazmat team does have a decon unit and uh, another task force that will respond. Excellent, excellent. And Adam, small department, but what are you doing for the roadway incident? Have you got anything that you're available within your own department? Um, we're set up as a hazmat operations level. Um, we do have a interstate railroad that runs through the Iowa Interstate Railroad, and plus we also got the um, Interstate I-80. Um, we do contain some spills of any type of fluids, but as far as any type of big situations, we would definitely have the uh, neighboring department over, and we can also set up for decon. Excellent, excellent, good stuff. All right, well, we're going to try a little experiment here tonight. I'm going to share some uh, uh, couple of incidents that are uh, around and about. Uh, these are older pictures, so I don't know how well this is going to come out. But we, we understand that when we talk about hazmat, we're trying to do things a little differently. So what happens when that routine run you go on actually might turn into a hazmat incident? Is uh, everybody got that image? We got that image up on the screen. Let's see if I can get you anything. I can't get it much larger. Has everybody got that? Looks good for me, Pete. Okay. So you, we got a firefighter looking at the back of a box truck. Um, this came in, interestingly enough. I, I really struggled with this. I know, I know YouTube gets cranky about using uh, video in a Hangout on Air. I didn't want to play the audio for this, but the audio for this really is, uh, is key. This comes in as a vehicle accident. Um, okay, somewhere in the middle of the dispatch, it comes in as a truck. So now it's not a vehicle accident anymore. It's a truck accident. So then it comes in as a truck accident. The vehicle is on fire. Then it comes in as the truck accident vehicle on fire with energized wires and a victim trap. So this incident literally in the time that we were responding to it uh, really kind of grew legs on us, if you will. And so here you are, the local fire department responding to an incident, and it's, it's changing on you as you go. Now, these are late in the scene. Now, obviously, you know, that, that pike pole only serves as a guillotine, right? When you kick the pike pole away, the, the door's going to fall on your head. But, uh, you know, lessons learned. And I don't know if you can see my mouse moving, but right here on the ground, that is actually diesel uh, that is coming down the street. There was foam applied to attempt to extinguish the fire, and we'll talk about that a little bit. There is a, um, I was actually put in charge of the hazmat for this incident, uh, along with that guy. That's a state responder. Uh, and so what we had here was, you can see the entanglement with the wires uh, on the truck. Uh, the driver actually came out that door. The, uh, the door facing up, that's the way the driver came out, literally pushed away the wires and came out of that door. Um, situation is somewhat stabilized now. Uh, there were a couple of great in instances in this particular um, uh, situation. So let me just see if I, that's the hazmat guy telling me to go farther away. Uh, and then he said, no, I just told you go away some more. So obviously I wasn't paying very much attention to him. Um, and so, you know, some, some mistakes were made. Some things were done incorrectly. Uh, obviously the, the command structure that we have here probably should not be in a downhill position, right? So some of the very basics, we did some things wrong. Uh, we were a little bit downhill of the incident. Uh, but we, we had to do it. So the problem came in for me attempting to identify, and, and there you see probably the, the end result. We were attempting to identify contents. Uh, now, in a small delivery truck like this, I don't know what the regulations are, but where, where would be your first source of information? Anybody, where would you get the first source of information if you were under 1,000 pounds? Greg, where would you find info? Uh, 
So I'd go right to the driver if I could talk to him. Right. So uh, you, you want the bill of laden, right? You want the manifest. What's he delivering? Would be awesome. So this is in the early days of Hazmat, and the bill of laden was, in fact, with the driver, who had it in his back pocket while strapped lying flat to a backboard halfway to the hospital. So, <laughs> so there's, your, there's your bill of laden story, right? Murphy came to this incident without question. The other problem that we had, and I had a very significant close call at this incident, uh, I got in the back of the truck. My, my assignment was to make a determination on what the hazmat actually was, what we were doing. Uh, we got in there, we, we opened it up, we did some things. And at some point, the police officer who was at the scene said, you know, there's something going on with the leaves on the trees. The leaves on the trees, he thought he heard a humming noise. Well, what happened here was that the power was rerouted and the truck was, in fact, energized again with myself and another firefighter in the back of the box. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about power. I think it's worth talking about uh, because there's a couple of interesting things that happen with power that reroute. Uh, the, the material in the truck was a bunch of flammables. You can see the scorch mark on the, on the side and the roof of the truck where it had ignited. Uh, foam was used. Uh, there was some flammable materials. There was some nitrated materials. The guy was essentially a sign painting uh, situation. So there was some silver nitrate. There was some other flammables and some other stuff. But this was a great incident in that it really snuck up on us. You know, you're responding to a vehicle accident, and suddenly that was something with flammable liquids on fire, energized with a trapped victim. And then the fact is that there was a mix of materials all under a thousand pounds uh, in that in that truck. So, um, you know, I just thought I would share that one. Uh, is anybody in, in his uh, the, the folks, the techs are, are actually going through it. It's partially unloaded at this point. Um, and and we'll leave it at that. So any I any that we call that the sniff test. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, it tastes like chicken, right? Is that? What... <laughs> um, so anyway, just talking about one of those incidents. Anybody had a similar incident? I, I don't want it to be uh, that happened to be one that I thought was relative because you don't need the whole hazmat team at that point. You would ultimately, I think, today. If it, were, if it were done today, you probably would need the whole hazmat team. But it's interesting, one of the points I wanted to make, that uh, you, have to, um, you have to shift gears. When we talk about hazmat, you have to shift gears, and somebody says this is now a hazmat incident versus the car accident or anything else. Kevin, you said you lost the picture there for a second. Are you, did you get the grasp of the incident? or? Uh, well, basically, I guess, Pete, I listened to you carefully as you described it. I saw it for about 10 or 15 seconds. Um, but I, I would say, Pete, uh, you know, just in terms of what you said, shifting gears, you know, probably slowing down would be right at the top of that list. Um, and once you uh, ascertained uh, the driver's status or anybody else, uh, uh, the life, it's a life safety question and, and mitigated that, then... Uh, it's really time to slow down and, and figure out what we have and how, how we're going to mitigate it. Yeah, and so, you know, one of the first things at a hazmat incident, right, is isolate and deny entry, and secondarily is, you know, remove all sorts of ignition. Well, we had called for the power company. As you saw, the whole top of the pole was essentially in proximity to that truck. Uh, we had called for the power company. This incident occurred almost on the state line between Rhode Island and Connecticut. And power is actually fed from a couple of different directions. And I don't know if this is the case. If you've had training with your power company, I'd like to hear from Greg because I don't know if the same situation applies uh, uh, to our north. But essentially, power will automatically try to reroute itself three times. So when the squirrel jumps on the wire and something shorts out, the power goes down, it will automatically try to reroute itself. 
it will then look for a secondary way and see if they can do it. And, and this is all computerized, and it will try to reroute itself again. And generally, after the third time it attempts to reroute itself, it will, it will be dead. Um, we got there somewhere between time two and three. Uh, and, and when the system detected that there was no power, actually power was shifted to us from the state of Connecticut, which we didn't have any control over uh, or any awareness of. So again, when you're dealing with power for the folks that are watching or what have you, make sure you interface with your local power company so you understand exactly how this happens. Uh, uh, Greg, is that the same situation? Are you familiar with your distribution system up there? Is that a similar thing that happens or you're not sure? Well, we, I can't say for sure about automatic rerouting, Pete, but um, I, I'm in a rural area. And, uh, we actually, Vancouver Island gets 80% of British Columbia, the whole province's uh, power outages because we're out in the ocean and we have the big windstorms. Uh, so we have a lot of the properties around here have backup generators on them, and if they're not wired properly, they'll backfeed even when we have power switched off. Right. So we deal with a lot of power lines down here in the wintertime, and... Um, our, for us, the rule is we treat them like they're always live unless we've got hydro on scene and they've got the disconnects pulled and locked out and they've let us know. Right, right. Yeah, the the, the generators are a big deal. I've actually had uh, power cut at structural fires and the place have an automatic generator which uh, refires up the power to the building. Uh, suddenly you sent the crew in and you think it's uh, you think it's down. And in fact, it isn't. So uh, we just did our first fire on a um, house that had covered in solar panels and wind generators on the top. And of course, it was on fire, and the wind generator was going around like mad. And <laughs> nobody knew where. Uh, you know, we had the we had the uh, meter pulled, but who knows? Most yeah. of this stuff is jury rigged. So yeah. Yeah, well, that's you're right, Greg. I mean, it's not bad enough if a professional installs it. It's if the homeowner tries to install it and, and uh, you know, it's homebrew, uh, you certainly have that. Solar is, uh, you know, we, we need to do a night on solar here because it's uh, it's clearly something that uh, affects, it's, it's going to become more and more uh, important to us for sure. Ethan, your thoughts about the incident? Anything uh, you want to chime in? Excuse me, chime in about? No, definitely, like you said, isolate and deny entry and get the power company called early, yeah. And, and you know, lessons learned, right? So, you know, before the patient gets shipped off to the hospital and strapped onto the backboard, so now we're calling the ambulance, you know, get the papers out of his pocket, try to identify, and it, it really became a, uh, a, a little bit of a problem. Uh, one of the things that helped us actually was, uh, the automobile registration on the truck, was, it came from Connecticut. We ran it through the Connecticut police, got a hold of the company, called the company, and we were starting to get some information. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a little bit uh, a convoluted situation, and a ton of lessons were learned. But I, the, the key piece of this one, and uh, we, I do it when I teach this program, uh, we, we play the audio. And if you really pay attention to the audio, it becomes critical that you can determine this is not your average truck accident when you're, when you're there. Adam, is that something that could happen to you, right? You don't have a lot of industry or what have you, but could you get, uh, could you get this box truck uh, flipped over? Oh, definitely. We could um, in our area. Yeah, definitely. And, and certainly without the quantity involved, you, uh, you know, you'd end up with, you know, no placards, no no label. Well, labels on containers and packages, but uh, but that's really it. Uh, let's see if we can do this, and I'll I'll throw this screen share up, and I'll ask if you you know. Let's make sure everybody can see it, uh, because I, you know, obviously that's uh, that's part of the puzzle here. Um, okay, so uh, let's see if we can do that. Uh, a little bit hard to see. Has everybody got that one now? If you can, uh, Ethan's nodding. Adam, you got it. Greg, you got it. Thumbs up. Yeah, okay. And Kevin, you got it. Good, good. So uh, a local fire department gets called. I was mutual aid on this incident when we figured out that it was a problem. We got a call for an explosion. 
And you can see that this is an apartment building, or it's a little difficult to see, but there's a couple of windows. This is an apartment building with multiple units in it. And uh, this is a large steel tank. Uh, if that fireman is uh, six foot high, it's, it's a five or a six foot steel tank uh, laying across uh, out in back of this apartment. The caller was from that apartment. Now, fire department said, now we don't have any fire. We have no fire, but there is a report of an explosion. So, uh, you know, we start, you, you know, I got an idea. Let's go look at this tank and see what's going on with this tank. Well, then you kind of start going backwards and you look at the building next to the apartment building. And I'll see if I can give you a better shot of that. Yeah, there is where that tank came through the corner of the adjacent building. So we still don't have any fire, but now you've got a structural problem. You've got some issues going on. Is there a potential for further collapse or what have you? Uh, what's going on? Again, this is still a fire department response. You don't have anything major going on here at, at this point in time. So now you look inside this garage and it looks pretty pretty messy. Uh, that's really all I care you see about it's messy. You do see that there's a cylinder right here. There appears to be a cylinder of some kind of compressed gas right here. Just all sorts of debris on the floor and in the general area. And then you begin to take a look. So again, fire department, how would your fire department, and this is kind of a rhetorical question, I don't want you to answer it. Are you geared up? Are you geared down? Are you just wearing turnouts with no mask at this point? Because you don't have a problem here. You don't have any problem. And I can tell you that firefighters were walking in here in full protective gear, air packs on, but not breathing air, because it really just looks like there was this massive explosion and nobody can really figure out what's going on yet. Uh, that we have any hazard except we do see this cylinder in there and it appears to be stuff all over the floor maybe motor oil maybe motor oil not sure um, this is how the tank took flight uh, when that tank left the building it struck this 55 gallon drum which it was full again no labels no markings you see the evidence of oil on the floor uh, and this drum, uh, this uh, cylinder that you see outside actually took flight off of this drum. So now as the companies begin to investigate this drum, what, now we see drums. Now we see leakage on the floor. Now we're beginning to think about hazmat. We're beginning to think that this might be a hazmat situation. And so we, we activate the hazmat team. I get out here where it's, you know, nice and dark and safe outside and you begin to see these little containers that I'm circling these gallon jugs I'll explain that in a minute we began to get some additional resources we brought additional recovery drums to the scene because we thought we were going to overpack more 55s than we had but the real key to this incident is these uh, gallon or two and a half gallon containers that are out here and uh, here you see cases in cases of them. So this company, and I'll see if I've got one more there. Yeah, it's kind of a better shot of the inside, uh, some of the debris. Uh, let's, let's see if we can go back to that. Uh, what happened is, this is a tree spraying company. So uh, when you, uh, does anybody know how you distribute or dissolve pesticides? What's the best method for uh, dissolving pesticides and making them able to distribute? Anybody know? You, you dissolve them in oil. Generally, you have a hydrocarbon, and they carry very well in the hydrocarbon. And so what happened was these are all uh, containers of essentially the insecticide 7. So uh, it's a trade name. It's actually called Cabaril, C-A-B-R-Y-L, Cabaril. But what happened was uh, many of these containers were damaged because of stuff flying around. They are not explosive by nature. 
Uh, they are not flammable by nature other than there is a petroleum, uh, uh, what do I want to say, uh, uh, a carrier, right? The carrier is a petroleum-based, uh, oil-based situation, and, uh, and, and that's what you had. So what the, the punchline here was, was there was an awful lot of uh, decon, awful lot of decon, and we actually had uh, pesticide uh, on the floor, exposed, or what have you. Now, I'm sure you're all sitting there, and the, and the viewers that are watching this are going to say, well, what the heck was the tank? What was this explosion? That explosion, quite frankly, was the overpressure for an air tank a compressed air tank in the garage, in the maintenance area. There was nothing in that tank except air. And what happened was, and you can, again, very, very hard to see because of the quality here going through the hangout. Well, let me see. You could actually see, if you look closely, all of the rivets off the bottom of the tank. Let me see if I can reshare that. Um, all of the bottom of the tank, you can see the tears in the metal almost as you begin to look at it, uh, where all the rivets came out. Basically, this was just a compressed air tank and a compressor, which overpressurized, shot that tank off. So your, your hazmat here was not the incident. It was the result of an incident. So again, just kind of thinking outside a little bit, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Any, any thoughts on that? Again, not your big deal hazmat situation, and the fire department gets stumbled into it. Um, I can tell you when, you know, when somebody sees the damaged drum, they call me. I get up there. It takes, I don't know, seven, eight minutes, ten minutes for me to get up there, uh, and and you say drums or whatever, and then we see cases of these containers. So we actually bagged one of the containers, not ruptured, got it out there so we were able to identify uh, and, and do what we had to do. So uh, uh, I'll open it up for discussion. Any discussion or any questions? And uh, again, what we're trying to talk about is can an incident sneak up on you? Can it sneak up on you? Any, any thoughts from anybody on the panel or questions? I'll take a shot, Pete. Uh, sure. You know, I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, but this is, again, it's a proceed with caution uh, situation. Um, you know, is there any life hazard? If the answer to that is no, then we really have to dial it down. Um, I would say two things. Number one, we get have to get in touch with that business owner right away to find out uh, what his business is, uh, what the hazards are, uh, does he have any uh, idea how this uh, explosion took place. And the other thought I would have is uh, to um, limit um, the recon uh, to uh, as few a number of people as possible. So you know, if, if we get that first alarm assignment, let's say in Framingham would be 14 guys and a chief, um, you know, maybe I'd commit one engine company. Uh, so that uh, I limit my exposure in case that is a bad situation. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. Yeah, no, excellent, Kevin. And again, that's the kind of discussion I want to have because we're, we're doing this for our viewers as well as for us. And, and I will tell you a couple of things. Uh, it took probably seven or eight minutes for it to be recognized for what it was. Uh, and they did limit personnel. Uh, personnel was limited. And interesting was the owner actually lived on site. The owner was awakened by us in the front yard. So uh, the owner was very readily accessible to us and was able to provide some information. Uh, and, and there were some early, early mistakes here. Uh, people were trying, first two companies were trying to look up a trade name in the DOT guidebook, right? You can't look up a trade name. You have to look up a chemical name, right? A, a tissue you blow your nose with is just that. It's a tissue. We would look up Kleenex. Kleenex is a brand name. You're not going to find that as you begin to look up. So a lot of lessons were learned early on. And again, really, the, the, the incident here was was a cleanup incident. It was uh, decon our personnel and leave it to the owner 
uh, to really uh, establish the cleanup or, or what have you. Greg, any thoughts about that? Do you have any uh, tree spraying or uh, uh, farms, pesticides, any of that stuff around? Yeah, definitely a few farms. Um, don't recall running any hazmat incidents. I've been on the department since 2005. We're really a small department, Pete, so 100 to 150 runs a year, and that includes the EMS calls. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, but again, you know, it, it, we don't, Hazmat really doesn't care. You've got stuff, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, there's definitely stuff, so I want to include you as part of the conversation. Ethan Absolutely. and Adam, any, uh, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry, Greg. No, no, it, uh, it's out there, and when we pre-plan businesses, we've got some light industrial, uh, it's out there, and we've got some responses planned for it, but from working incidents, nothing in the last few years. Excellent, excellent. Ethan or Adam, any uh, questions or anything I can help you with about uh, that one? In our community, you were asking what's around in ours. Uh, we are pretty much farming all the way around where I live at, and we do have a co-op here in town that's just right down the road from my house, and they actually do have a building that they store uh, seeds and fertilizers and stuff like that, and that actually got a placard on the uh, side door and then just out on the highway just as you come into town they have a chemical plant a lot of their anhydrous and stuff is out there and uh, yeah we do we have, we have that type of stuff here um, we get called out every so often to the anhydrous plant for an open tank so yeah we have it here Yes, no, no question. And those are the real, real nasty ones. And I, and I pointed this incident out to you because of pesticides. There are a lot of things, you know, if you told me it was a gasoline leak, well, I'm a fireman. I'll, I'll take care of gasoline. That's something in my wheelhouse. I can foam it. I can do stuff. It burns. That's my deal. If it's uh, some other things. When you begin to talk about pesticides, insecticides, and all those things, when you start to deal with the poisons, you know, unless you're talking about level A entry suits, our, our turnout gear, you're well beyond the protection of your turnout gear. So uh, certainly something to, uh, to take a look at. Uh, Ethan, anything on that one before I, I look at another one? No, just one more thing I want to say is, again, uh, get in contact with that building owner because no one knows the building like they do, and they can be a very valuable resource. Yeah, it, it, the only thing I would caution you about building owners and trucking company owners, and it, it's been my experience. I was a I was a hazmat guy. I mean, that was my that was my bailiwick for for early on in my career. Uh, they will help you up until the time they think they're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when they think there's a liability or they think they're in trouble, uh, they, they, sometimes the information slows down. It never really stops, uh, but it slows down. Uh, let's take a look at another one um, just for sake of discussion. Um, so this one is... Uh, uh, this one is kind of an interesting one. Uh, again, a little difficult. The company says plating, a plating company. So what does that say to you right up front? Is there any indication that there may be something wrong here? If you do not have exposure to plating companies, exposure, this is a hazmat talk, so exposure being the pun there. Uh, if you don't have exposure to plating companies, you, a couple of things. You want to be thinking about um, acids. Uh, you want to be thinking about solvents, and you probably at some point, depending on precious metals or whatever, what it is they're doing, you probably might be talking about cyanide uh, at some point. Uh, this was a mutual aid situation. Uh, not much to see there. Uh, you, you really can't read that drum, but the drum says uh, trichloroethylene, which is a very common uh, solvent. Uh, that's used in the plating facilities. But the key to this one is this. This is a, a small metal drum with a bag. You can see the plastic liner uh, and there's a lid on the drum. And I don't, I, I really can't do it justice, but I don't know. Let's see one of our youngsters. Uh, Ethan, can you make out anything where my mouse is moving? Can you read through that bag at all? Just anything you can pull out of there. Anything? No, I can't. Yeah, I, we're losing a little bit of detail in the, uh, in the hangout, certainly. 
but the powder you see on that bag, you can actually see the word Y-A-N-I-D-E. So you can't see cyanide, but you can see A-N-I-D-E. Uh, so in fact, you had cyanide uh, right here on the premises. It was not involved in the incident, but it certainly wouldn't take much for firefighters in bunker pants in a darkened situation to brush up against that. Uh, that was being used at the time, so that's the reason it was out like that. And again, I always show, uh, anybody know, when you see a product like this, uh, we call it a, a beer keg, uh, and it says corrosive and oxidizer. Uh, what, what does that tell us? Does that ring any bells? That's, that's a pretty unique one. Uh, that will almost always be nitric acid almost always be nitric acid in that format. Uh, so again, lots and lots of problems, uh, and that came in as a building fire. Uh, it really was a tank of that trichloroethylene that, uh, that had melted down and overheated, uh, created a lot of smoke. Many, many firefighters uh, treated at this incident. Uh, this was a strange day in the state of Rhode Island many years ago. Again, in the early days of Hazmat, and Rhode Island didn't have all of the resources that Mass had, uh, but there were 15 firefighters uh, treated in this community on this day, and the same day in another part of Rhode Island, which is kind of a joke for you folks that come from large areas, you know, Rhode Island, you can drive across it in an hour, uh, but... Uh, uh, there were 35 firefighters injured in another hazmat situation. So it's, uh, it was there, there, you know, 50 firefighters total injured in two incidents on, on one day. So the plating company, just a lot of very nasty things uh, far beyond. You know, this is clearly a tier two in Massachusetts. Uh, uh, this is an entry level team for hazmat, uh, certainly an entry uh, team. This is a big deal. Uh, you need protective equipment and so forth. So uh, any, uh, any question on that one uh, before we, we go on? And again, I, I'm just throwing these out here uh, to generate discussion. So uh, don't, don't mean to be hogging the thing. Uh, yeah, Greg, what do you got? Did you get, you were a second due on this one? or I was mutual aid, and the incident was almost resolved when I arrived. By the time I arrived, the, the fire problem and the overheated product was, was really done and over with maybe minutes into it. So, yeah, I was, uh, I was late arriving to this one. So I guess t two questions. When did they recognize it as the hazmat incident, and how were the guys exposed? Uh, early on, uh, they recognized plating being a big deal, and it was really um, uh, probably lack of mass discipline, uh, not in the building, but let's say at the entry or just outside the entry, right? When, you, when you're talking about fumes, everybody puts a pack on when they're going in the building, but again, there was not a good, uh, a well-defined hot zone at this point in time. So uh, that, that was probably, it was respiratory exposure, and it was probably, uh, you know, a little bit of, of uh, a lack of mask, mask discipline at the time that I think caused that. So uh, any, anything else on that one? Again, uh, that one's an easy one to see, right? That's different than the first couple we talked about. This one didn't sneak up on you. You know what it is when you're going into it. You're going into a commercial occupancy as opposed to something else that happened uh, o over and above. Let's see if we can look at, uh, at uh, one more incident. We can probably get one more in. This one, I was very late uh, getting to this incident. Uh, but um, you take a look at the building, and you can see that uh, this came in as a report of smoke coming from a building. And as you look over the top of the roof, uh, again, you're looking at an old photograph, you're looking at an old picture. Um, is there anything about that smoke that looks different to anybody on the panel? Uh, again, difficult to see in the, in the share and the, the, the photograph, but uh, is there anything that appears to be different? Greg? Uh, I mean, overall, the photo is quite yellow, but it looks, it looks like it's got quite a yellow color to me. 
A little bit of a tinge, right? It's probably not the right color, right? So it's safe to say it's not, you know, good good point. It's probably not the right color. And you know how we, we preach today, and it was true years ago, you know, you preach about what's the most important thing upon arrival is we talk about doing a 360. You know, do the 360, get around the backside of the building and see what's going on. Um this is clearly before the days of Photoshop, so I'd love to tell you that that's a Photoshop or a Sim, uh, but that is neither a Photoshop or a Sim. Uh, that is a product called Red Fuming Nitric Acid, which was uh, actually escaping the building, and uh, you know, in this back area it was completely. Now, you know, great hazmat picture. Do you see anyone in that picture? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody was in that picture, and uh, it, it's a little deceiving. That vehicle is uh, is uh, quite quite beyond the cloud. It uh, it did get damaged, but it is quite beyond the cloud. But again, a very very uh, you could see. Excuse me, how somebody could get in trouble. Uh, gee, that smoke doesn't look quite right, but let's go in and take a look where somebody coming around from the backside would say, hey, wait a minute, we're, we're, we're well out of our means. Uh, uh, that product would eat your turnout gear, your air pack, uh, everything completely. Uh, that's certainly a level A uh, entry without any question at all. So uh, that's, uh, that's an easy one. Uh, let me see what we have here. Um, yeah, this is kind of, I, I guess I'll just go right into this one, and then we'll we'll see where we end up. So uh, let me ask you, if you're a firefighter with a Scott and you come in this building, uh, do you think there's any chance that there's chemicals in this building? Yeah, uh, probably, right, with that many 55-gallon drums. Now, anybody, Kevin would probably tell you, and Greg, you probably know this, uh, anytime you see drums stacked three high, they're probably empty. You, you, you generally don't see drums stacked that high unless they are not empty. Um, I, I use this example for a couple of things, and we don't have time to get into it here, but interesting that this diamond-shaped symbol on this 55-gallon uh, drum is the name of the company and has nothing to do with hazmat. You know, we've been trained to look for diamond shapes, symbols, labels, or what have you. That diamond shaped symbol is nothing but the name of the company. So, uh, you know, you got to pay attention. This happens to be a mixing vat in the floor. It is a triangle uh, uh, situation in the floor. There are a couple of doors you see on hinges that flap open, and material is mixed in this vat. In this situation, there was a, a, an explosion. Uh, those doors uh, flipped open. There was a very significant flash fire. And uh, we'll talk about the flash fire. And we'll talk about the impact of sprinklers uh, at, a, at a hazmat. So uh, let's see if we can do that. Here's uh, a, a bunch of powder. Uh, scared the heck out of us when we arrived. Because you, you really, you know, bags of powder, what are we talking about with white powder here? It really was, um, it was a caustic, it was probably something a little different than soda ash, what I would call soda ash. It was a, uh, a lime-based agent, so it was not as horrible. But you can see puddles on the floor where, you can see the bags are scorched, uh, clearly. And you can see puddles on the floor where the sprinklers had operated during this flash fire. Um, it, when people start writing things in magic marker on the top of the drum, you know things are, uh, are, are good, right? Only use this drum for this. Uh, that's what we're pointing out there. Again, the labeling. Uh, imagine a firefighter in uh, zero visibility wandering around in this place. Uh, what what kind of things are you into? You notice the different types of drums, drums with snap rings that uh, hold powders maybe, other drums for liquids, the understanding the different types of drums and what they're capable of and what what commodity they might hold is important. Cardboard drums, how do cardboard drums hold up when the sprinklers operate? You know, what what's the impact of uh, of that cardboard drum? Interesting here where we talk about always look for the labels and you can see very clearly that the flash fire took most of this label. 
uh, very, very quick. It didn't destroy the whole label. It took most of that label off, a little difficult to read uh, if you had to do that. We're, we're taught to look for labels and those things. Uh, and again, a, a great picture of different types of drums that will probably hold different commodities uh, in, this, in this photograph. Look at the picture of the bench. Uh, you can see the flash fire coming from the left to the right and the sprinkler head operating on the right hand side. I think that's just an amazing photograph uh, of, of where the flash fire came around, burned the left side, and just literally drew a line where, uh, where it was extinguished quickly by, by sprinkler protection uh, from above. So uh, again, just, uh, just a couple of thoughts. So uh, again, I'm talking about hazmat, what do we want the listener to know? First of all, any, any comment or question about that, uh, about that incident? Kevin? I just make uh, a couple of comments. Um, how important it is for us to get out in our districts and uh, look at these buildings so we have a half an idea what's in there, what the hazards are, speaking to the business owners, etc. And uh, along with that, uh, how important code enforcement is. Uh, you know, uh, in, in Framingham anyway, we have sort of a two-headed monster, the suppression side, which is what I'm on, and the prevention side. But how important that prevention side is, uh, code enforcement, uh, mandating sprinklers, uh, et cetera. Boy, that's a real advertisement for uh, sprinkler protection. Yeah, that was a great incident. Now, again, we were, you know, one of the primary concerns once you realize sprinklers are flowing is where's that runoff? Where is it going? Uh, what what chemicals are, is it carrying with it as you begin to do that? So, you know, sprinklers are always our friend. Uh, but again, in the hazmat situation, it may be a little different uh, if, if, you're, uh, if you're containing runoff or if you're concerned about runoff. And again, I, I thought that was an interesting occupancy because you have stuff in cardboard drums, you have paper bags, you have whatever, and you have steel drums. Once you've got a fire and sprinklers operating, uh, you know, the old-fashioned term about a hazmat is a hazmat is anything that's out of its container. Well, you certainly have your fire protection could actually be damaging or compromising your container in that case, and uh, and that might give you some trouble. So, yeah, absolutely, Kevin. Uh, uh, Pre-planning. If you've got a business, in these cases, the, the last couple were chemical, uh, make sure you know what's out there. But again, as we talked about in the first couple, uh, don't underestimate that the hazmat can sneak up on you. Uh, you know, as those first couple of ones, it uh, it really could sneak up. Adam, what do you got? Uh, the one that with the uh, reddish smoke that was coming out of the building on the back side. Yeah. You guys have to evac any residents that lived around the uh, area. That was a that was a commercial uh, establishment. So the only thing around it was really businesses. It was uh, it was in a major city. Uh, so there was a minimal evacuation, and the issue there was that the product uh, reacts and vaporizes uh, pretty aggressively with moisture. And what happened is this stuff had actually gone into the floor drain of a building and was picking up moisture. So once they understood what was what was causing the continuing fume up, uh, they were able to contain it pretty quickly. It, uh, it solved itself, but that was a heavy industrial area, uh, that, that particular incident. Uh, good question, good question, because that's what it's about, right? It's about people. It's, uh, it's really about people, and if you can get them out, uh, uh, for sure. Uh, Ethan made a comment. Yeah, absolutely. The building is your enemy, but so is the stuff, right? This, so the building, you know, in the first case, uh, oh, second case, actually, with the air tank exploding, interesting. The building has the potential of falling down on you, right? The roof's been compromised and at least one exterior wall in a corner, but then the contents become an issue to you as well. Uh, and, and again, you know, you go to any auto repair garage in any of our communities, that anybody on the panel, they've got an air compressor there. They've got an air compressor. There's no question about it. And uh, I, can you imagine, I mean, that incident was late at night. Uh, I want to say, I don't remember. It's funny. There's a clock in the picture. I think it's like uh, almost midnight. Uh, so there was nobody in there. But can you imagine that tank taking off and hitting a civilian? 
I mean, it just... Uh, uh, phenomenal uh, what could have happened there. There's no question that would have been a fatality. So let's leave our listeners with something. Uh, let's let's come up with your best uh, hazmat tips. Uh, let's just run the panel quickly, and that's where we'll uh, we'll leave it tonight. Um, you know, isolate and deny entry. Important to recognize. If we think size up is important on a fire scene. I think size up on the hazmat scene and the ability for somebody to say, you know, Kevin used the term a couple of times, slow down. The ability for everybody to say, stop and wait a minute here. Uh, you know, none of the situations I gave you had life safety involved. Uh, that, that was not, you know, we were the biggest life hazard was the fire department. But uh, so the recognition of the incident, I think, uh, and, and I got burned by some of those early ones early on where it creeped up on you, uh, it, it snuck up on you. I think those are the ones that get us in trouble. Kevin, any thoughts, any uh, situations you've had where uh, you've, you've got a tidbit you can share as we begin to summarize? Um, Pete, I remember learning years ago uh, uh, to ask three questions. What is the product? Uh, even if you just identify solid, liquid, or gas, and you know, with each one of those, we ramp up our awareness. We're more concerned of, about gases than solids, for example. But what is the product? Uh, how can it hurt me? And is there enough there to hurt me? Um, those have always been basic questions that have always I tried to keep in the back of my head. As you know, you have to go through your sources starting with the ERG and maybe going to the NIOSH book and MSDS sheets, sheets and so forth but those three questions what is the product uh, how does it hurt me and is there enough there to hurt me that's always been a good sort of uh, keep it simple stupid uh, thing that I've tried to remember excellent that's exactly the kind of stuff I'm, I'm looking at Greg some of your hazmat some of the operation stuff or any of your previous experience or uh, life experience what what can you leave us with well I guess speaking from the small department point of view we stress really heavily for the company officers and uh, even the chief officers to maintain the big picture and the guys are often very task focused and if, if it's an MBI or that sort of thing is to make sure that there's somebody uh, step back and looking for things that are leaking and we keep uh, binoculars on all the rigs and hopefully the guys uh, know enough to park could walk away and pull the glasses out and have a look for placards and that sort of thing. Excellent, excellent, good stuff. Ethan, words of advice here. Well, I think it comes down to even before the hazmat run, knowing your your buildings, being intimately familiar with them, and knowing what's in them, and also uh, the, getting around to the Charlie side and getting that 360. Yeah, I think the 360 and a hazmat is a big deal. There's no question. Adam, what'd you take away from tonight? Anything you can uh, share? I'm gonna go with Ethan on part of it. Uh, knowing your building and what's in it. Um, I had kind of a past experience. We had a small factory here in town that's no longer here but it did catch fire at one time and uh, they would always send the uh, map and the uh, hazmat sheets of what's inside the structure and something we really never paid attention to and it caught fire and as we made entry into the room of course it was dark and the adjacent room is where the fire was at and after we got it put out we sat and talked to some maintenance guys and said there was 55 gallon drums of methanol alcohol stored in the room that we had made entry in not knowing I think if we would have looked at the map and looked at what was stored where we would have had a better idea but yeah I gotta go with Ethan as knowing the building and what's in it. Yeah and you know that's a common problem Adam uh, it goes back to what Kevin said so you got a fire inspector that goes out there and he's got a three ring binder full of chemicals and that never gets put on the first dual engine company's desk or you know the information doesn't get shared or we have the information and we don't always uh, use it the way we should. So a little discussion on hazmat tonight. We looked at a couple of simple incidents. Uh, we hope we gave the listeners something to talk about. Uh, and there's a little bit of a takeaway here. Uh, I, I actually do a whole program on, on hazmat. That's one of the things I talk about a little bit. I won't make you a certified technician, but I'll make you a little, little safer and a little smarter. Uh, that's one of the things we can do. Uh, so as we begin to wrap up for tonight, uh, I, I always tell folks, uh, if you want to get a hold of me, you can get a hold of me at Pete at PeteLamb.com. You can always chase me down on Twitter. 
Uh, the the thing is at Pete Lamb, so you can find me on Twitter if that's your choosing. And we would ask that you watch us live. You can find all of our archives at firefightingtoday.com. You can see this show uh, and all of our past shows. And if you happen to, uh, if you can't be on the panel and you'd like to watch us, you can catch us next Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern. And uh, we'll see you again next week. In the meantime, be safe.